So I think I'll leave that up because the, the light from the document can I think helps to illuminate the, the board so it's not so dark. All right, so yesterday uh, we started talking about uh, rational uh, exponents and arithmetic properties. Right. Yesterday we talked about um, rational exponents, right? We reviewed that concept. And then we talked about arithmetic properties of exponents. And as I've said in the past, math is made up of well-defined rules, right? So if you remember the well-defined rules, you should do well in math, okay? And so rational uh, exponents and uh, arithmetic properties of exponents, right, are two sets of rules that, that you should be familiar with, okay? All right. Why? I just want to get the last one. You were in class yesterday, weren't you? Yeah, I just didn't get the X, Y, Z, fourth, and the X. All right, so now let's talk about uh, exponential functions, okay? Now that we've reviewed the rules of exponents. And so an exponential function has the form has the form f of x is equal to a to the x. Okay. A is a real is a positive real number, not equal to one. Okay. So in words, a is a positive real number, not equal to one. Okay. That's what that says. And so, a, in a to the x, okay, a is the base of the exponential, and x is the exponent, okay. And so this is an exponential, and thus f of x equals a to the x is an exponential function, okay. So let's graph uh, the exponential function f of x equals 2 to the x. Okay? So a in this case right, is equal to the number 2. Okay? 2 is the base, and x is the exponent. So <laughs> we'll graph it in the coordinate plane. And um, you know how I learned to graph from back in way back in high school, right? You create a table, you select some values of x, then you calculate the corresponding values of y. And then you form the ordered pairs, right? You plot those points in the coordinate plane, and then you play connect the dots. That's how you get the graph of the function, okay? So I chose, so we're going to use three values of x. x equals 3, x equals 0, and x equals minus 2. Okay? Well, when x is equal to 3, y is equal to 2 cubed, and you know 2 cubed is equal to 8, and so the point 3, 8 is on the graph. Okay. When x is equal to 0, we have y is equal to 2 to the 0 power, which is equal to 1, 
And so the point zero 01 is on the graph. And you should recognize this is going to be the y-intercept, right? x equals zero at the y-intercept. And then when x is equal to minus three, y is equal to two raised to the minus three power. And two to the minus three, right from the rules of exponents, the same as one over two thirds. And two thirds, right, is eight. So y is equal to 1 8 if x is equal to minus 3. And so the point minus 3, 1 8 is on the graph. Okay. So we can plot these three points and then play connect the dots. Okay. So here's the origin. And then here is uh, 1, 2, 3 on the x-axis, and then we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 on the y-axis, and then we got the minus 1, minus 2, minus 3 on the x-axis. Okay. So the point 3, 8, right, with x equals 3 in up 8 units to y equals 8, The point, the y-intercept 0, 1, right, is right here at y equals 1. <coughs> and then we have the point minus 3, 1, 8. Well, here's minus 3 on the x-axis. 1, 8 is just above the x-axis, right? And now we play connect the dots. And so starting with this left point, the graph goes up like that, right? And you connect those three points with a smooth curve. Now what happens on the left end is the x-axis or the horizontal line, y equals zero, is a horizontal asymptote. And the graph flattens out, right? Right above the x-axis, one, two. So the x-axis is actually a horizontal asymptote. Okay. And that's what the graph of f of x equals to the x looks like. That's an exponential function. Okay. It's a graph of an exponential function. Okay. And we're going to learn later on, right, to look closer to this, um, in the next chapter, the next section in the text, right, you can see that uh, the graph of an exponential function passes the horizontal line test, right? No matter where you draw the horizontal line, it intersects the graph in only one location. So this exponential functions are one-to-one -one functions, and they have an inverse. And so we're going to learn about what the inverse function of an exponential function is. All right. Any questions on that, ladies and gentlemen? So next we're going to graph f of x equals two to the minus x power. This two is an exponential function. And you notice we don't have plus x in the exponent, we have minus x. But the graph of this function is just a transformation of this function. Okay? when we studied transformation of functions back in section 2.2. Now let's note that from the rules of exponents, 2 to the minus x is the same as 1 over 2 to the plus x. And 1 over 2 to the plus x from the rules of exponents is the same as 1 half raised to the x power. Now in the rules of exponents, this is equal to 1 to the x power over 2 to the x power. 1 to the x power is just 1, and 2 to the x power is just 2 to the x. So 2 to the minus x is equivalent to the exponential function 1 half raised to the x power. Okay? And remember, this number a right, has to be greater than 0, not equal to 1. 
and one half is square root of zero, not equal to one. So a is equal to one half in this case, okay? And so um, this is an exponential function. f of x equals two to the minus x is an exponential function. One half is the base, and x is the exponent. So there are two ways now you can graph this exponential function. Okay. One is you can create a table of, right, pick some values of x, calculate the corresponding values of y, form the ordered pairs, and plug and connect the dots. Another way is to remember from section 2.2 on transformations of functions, when you replace x with minus x, the graph of 2 to the minus x is the graph of 2 to the x transformed how? Um, across the y axis. Yeah, across the y axis, right? Replacing x with minus x just flips the graph across the y axis, right? And so all you got to do is change the sign of the x coordinates in the graph, okay? From plus 3 to minus 3. 0, negative 0, still 0, and minus 3 to plus 3. So let's create a column of ordered pairs. And, right, we go from uh, plus 3, comma 8 to minus 3, comma 8. We go the negative of 0 is still 0, so the y-intercept is still 0, 1. And then we go from minus 3, 1, 8 to plus 3, 1, 8. Okay. And so we're going to plot those points. To the best of our ability by hand. Okay. And so the point minus 3, 8, right, go to x equals minus 3, and then up 8 units. And then the uh, y intercept is still here at 0, 1. Remember, when you reflect the graph across the y axis, the y intercept serves as a pivot. And then the point 318, you go to x equals 3, and 1 eighth is just above the x axis. And now you play connect the dots. Okay? So the graph flattens out, going to the right, right above the x axis. Okay? Instead of flattening out going to the left above the x axis, it flattens out going to the right. And then it goes up to the left like that. How'd I do? Am I going to win any awards for my graphing ability? Okay. So, Let's just make a note. Okay. The graph of f of x equals 2 to the minus x is the graph of f of x equal 2 to the plus x reflected. across the x-axis. Okay. Now you could have got the graph of f of x equal to 2 to the minus x doing the same thing here. Is there a question about the y-axis? Did I say x-axis? Sorry. Yeah, I meant x y-axis. Thank you. Okay. 
Any questions on that, ladies and gentlemen? So we can perform transformations on exponential functions just like we do with any other function. All right. So let's talk about the shape of exponential functions in general. Now that we've done one for um, two specific values of A, the base. So in general, okay, if f of x is equal to a to the x power, okay, and a, the base, is greater than 1. <coughs> so we did f of x equals 2 to the x right? The base was greater than 1. So based on that, we know that if the base A is greater than 1, the graph is going to go up from left to right. Okay. It's going to flatten out going to the left. X-axis is the horizontal axis. And the y-intercept is y equals 1. You put 0 in for x up here, and you get a to the 0, which is equal to 1. So <coughs> we can make some comments about exponent, this exponential function okay, of this form. Okay. First of all, right, the graph goes to the left forever. It's continuous and it goes up and to the right forever. So the domain is the x coordinates, right? So there's no minimum x coordinates, there's no maximum x coordinate, and so the domain is all real numbers. And we did this back in section 2.1, right? You had you had an exam where you're given a graph of function, and you had to determine what the domain and the range was from the graph. That's what we're doing here. Okay. The range is the y coordinates. Okay. And there's no, right, the graph goes up forever, so there's no maximum y coordinate. Okay. Now the tricky part is down here. Okay. The further out to the left you go, the closer the graph gets to the x axis. The horizontal line y equals zero, right? Remember the x-axis in a horizontal line, y equals zero, coincide. And so the further I go left, the closer the graph gets to the x-axis, right? The closer the y coordinate for the points get to zero, but they never equal zero. And so the range is all real numbers greater than zero. It's actually the set of all positive. So this is the y coordinates. And we've already noted multiple times the y-intercept, right, is y equals 1. already noted a couple a few times that the horizontal asymptote is the x-axis or the horizontal line y equals zero. Remember, asymptotes are lines. Whether it's vertical line, horizontal line, or slack line. All right, any questions on this, ladies and gentlemen?
All right, now we got to consider the case, right? We consider the case where the base A is greater than 1. Now we got to consider the case where the base is between 0 and 1. Okay. Remember from the definition of an exponential function, A is greater than 0, not equal to 1. And all, right now, I'll be focused on A greater than 0. So, if f of x is equal to a to the x, and a is between 0 and 1, okay? Well, we did a graph of that, right, where a is equal to 1 half, okay? And 1 half is between 0 and 1. Okay. So, when the base is between 0 and 1, the graph doesn't go up from left to right, it goes down from left to right. Okay. But it still crosses the y-axis at the point zero, 1, that's y equals 1. Why is it always 0, 1? Well, when you, put, when you evaluate the function, it's always going to be that way? For this form, okay. no transformations. Well, if you do a transformation, the graph can get shifted right up, down, okay. right? Mm -hmm. And then that's going to affect the y-intercept if you start doing transformations, right? But the y-intercept is the value of the function x equals 0, and a to the 0 is equal to 1. Okay. Any non-zero real number raised to 0 power is equal to 1. All right, but we are going to be working with transformations of this. And if this thing gets shifted to the right or the left, right, it's going to affect the y-intercept. Okay. All right. The domain range y-intercept in horizontal asymptote are the same, right? when A is between 0 and 1, right? The graph goes up and to the left forever, goes to the right forever, so there's no minimum x-coordinate, there's no maximum x-coordinate, and so the domain, okay, it's all real numbers. There's no maximum y-coordinate, but as you go up to the right, the graph gets closer and closer to the horizontal line, y equals 0. The y coordinates get closer to zero, but they don't equal zero. And so the range, right, is all positive numbers, right? Zero to infinity. The y intercept remains the same. We just pointed that out. Okay. Y equals one for the point zero one. And the x axis of the horizontal line, right, is <laughs> the horizontal um, the x axis of the horizontal line, y equals zero, is the horizontal asymptote, right? So all this, these four properties that apply to a to the x, where a is greater than 1, apply also when a is between 0 and 1. Okay. All right, any questions on that, ladies and gentlemen? Okay. All right, so next we're going to talk about a very special exponential function called the natural exponential function. And before we do that, we have to talk about the number e. So, right, in high school, right, you all sure heard of the number pi, right? I got my pi shirt that I wear, right? And that has to do with trigonometry. Okay? And then we just got done working with the number i. Okay? So pi is equal to 3.14. One, the three decimal places. Okay. They go on forever. And then I, right, factoring polynomials is the imaginary number. Okay. And now we're going to talk about the number E. In high school, did any of you guys work with continuous compounding of interest? Maybe one of you. 
How many of you worked with the number E in high school? Do you know where it came from? Yeah. See, that's a tricky part. Okay. So the number E, okay, it actually comes from a sequence of numbers. And I'm not sure, do you guys work much with sequence of numbers when you were in high school? I remember seeing them on my ACT math test when I was 18. You did? You did a little bit? Okay. So we have a sequence of numbers generated by the sequence 1 plus 1 over n. n goes from 1 to infinity. So, n is the index. And 1 plus 1 over n is the formula in this case. And how you create the sequence of numbers, right? You start with n equals 1, then n equals 2, then n equals 3, then n equals 4. And you plug those values, right? And you can just go on forever, okay? That's what the infinity means. You just keep going on forever. And for each index, the number in the sequence is given by 1 plus 1 over n, okay? So let's point out the value of some numbers in the sequence. So n is the index. And then the value of the nth number in the sequence is given by the formula 1 plus 1 over n. Okay. So the first number in the sequence is when n is equal to 1. And O, O, O. I got a typo. For those of you who were lucky enough to get a hard copy, we have a type. The sequence isn't one, just 1 plus 1 over n. It's 1 plus 1 over n to the nth power. Yeah. I was looking at it, and I was like, you know what? I'm missing something. Okay. It's not the infinity symbol? Now, this is the formula. Okay. The index goes from n equals 1 to infinity, okay? You hear what I'm saying? This makes sense now. Okay. We got a typo. All right, so for those of you who got a hard copy, okay, we got to fix the formula, okay? It's 1 plus 1 over n to the n power. So when you put 1 in for n, you have 1 plus 1 over 1 to the first power. And when you simplify that, you get 2. Okay. The second number in the sequence, you put 2 in for n. Right. And then once you put a number in for n, it's just PEMDAS, right? And when you simplify that, as a decimal, that's 2.25. And then we can do that for n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5, and so forth. Okay. But we're going to jump. We're going to jump to n is equal to 10. So the tenth number in the sequence is 1 plus 1 tenth to the tenth power. And that is equal to 2.59. Now, I'm rounding off to the second decimal place. So you use your calculator, you know, 100,000 decimal places. Now let's jump to the 100th number in the sequence. When you put 100 in for n, you get 2.70. When you put 1,000 in for n, you get 2.7. One seven. Okay. So the one thousandth number in the sequence is two point seven one seven. 
Okay. I put 1,000 in for and in that form. So. And then let's jump out to and is equal to 10,000. The 10,000th number in the sequence is equal to 2.718, right? So you notice that n is n increases without bounds, without n. The number in the sequence isn't changing very much. Okay. And it turns out that as n increases without bound, goes on forever to infinity. Okay. This number converges, we say it converges to a single number on the real number line. And that number on the real number line, we gave um, the letter E to represent, right? We call it E, that one number on the real number. <laughs> and so as you keep going forever, the number in the right-hand column gets closer and closer to 2.7, 1, 8, 2, 8, the five decimal places, but the decimal places go on forever, okay? just like they do with pi. But we round pi off to a, to a, a couple of decimal places. Okay? That's an amazing thing. Okay? That is, n increases without bound. This number in the second column gets closer and closer to a single number on the real number. And that number on the real number line we call E, and to five decimal places, that number is 2.718. Okay. So that's where the number E comes from. Okay. And if you ever study continuous compounding of interest, that was the motivation for investing, investigating that sequence. Okay. All right. Well, E is a real number greater than one or greater than zero and not equal to one, right? And that's the requirement for an exponential function, right? The base has to be greater than zero, not equal to one. And E is greater than zero, not equal to one. So we can write an exponential function with E as the base, right? And so we have F of X, is equal to e raised to the x power, right? Instead of 2 to the x, right? Or 1 half to the x, or a to the x, right? I just replace the a in a to the x with the number e. So wherever you see e, you got to think to yourself 2.71, okay? All right, so this is, um, because e is a special number, this exponential function gets its own special name. And that's why it has the word natural in front of it. Okay. Natural exponential function. Okay. Because of this special number. Okay. All right. So E, right? E is the base right, of our special exponential function. Okay. All right, the graph of f of x equals e to the x. Do you think the graph's going to go up from left to right or down from left to right? It's going to go up because e is greater than 1, right? It goes down from left to right if the base is between 0 and 1, and e is greater than 1. So the graph of f of x equals e to the x goes up from left to right and crosses the y-axis at y equals 1 or the point zero. Okay. 
So it has the same general shape of any exponential function with a base greater than one. Okay. Any questions on it? So let me riddle me this. What's the domain of the natural exponential function? What's the range? Y intercept? And horizontal asymptote? Yeah, so it's got the same stuff, right? It's it, as um, uh, when we talked about in general for a to the x. Okay. Yeah. So the number e doesn't change any of this. Okay. All right. Now let's graph a transformation of the natural exponential function. Okay. And that kind of get. Uh, uh, Isabel, is it Isabel or Isabella? Isabella. Hey, there's an A at the end. So Isabella's uh, question is, is the y-intercept always the same? And the answer is no, if you do a transformation on the function, right? If you start, if you shift it right, shift it left, shift it up, shift it down, flip it over, right? That can, it's going to affect all that. Okay. So let's... Um, Sketch the graph of y equals 1 plus e to the x minus 1 power. Remember y and f of x, y values and function values are the same, right? They're interchangeable. Well, let's think about this, okay? We know what the graph of y equals e to the x looks like, right? This is this guy over here, okay? Now, in our equation, x is replaced with x minus 1, and then we add 1 to the right-hand side, right? So if I replace x and the exponent on e to the x with x minus 1, okay, the graph of e y equals e to the x minus 1 is the graph of y equals e to the x shifted how? Is it across the y-axis? The x x axis. So replacing x x minus one flips it over the x axis. Now this is two point two material, exam two material. Is it a um, uh, the opposite Com of compression? Compression. Yes. Move to the right. There you go. What did you just say? Move to the right. When you replace x with x minus a number, right, it shifts the graph to the right that many units, right? That's all we did. We replaced x with x minus a number, okay? So it shifts right one unit, okay? So replacing x with x minus one, shifts the graph of e to the x here to the right one unit, okay? And that's going to affect the y-intercept when you do that, okay? Now we're going to take this equation and we're going to add 1 to it. So the graph of y equals 1 plus e to the x minus 1 is the graph of y equals e to the x minus 1 shifted how? <coughs> Up how much? <coughs> one unit, right? So adding 1 to the right-hand side shifts this graph up one unit. And so when you combine the two together, the graph of y equals 1 plus e to the x minus 1 is the graph of y equals e to the x 
shift it to the right one unit, and then up one unit. Does that change the horizontal axis? Ah, very good. Yeah, because the whole graph gets shifted up one unit, right? So it's no longer flattening out above the x-axis. What's it flattening, and what line is it flattening out above? One. Y equals one, yeah. So the uh, y-intercept gets changed, the horizontal asymptote gets changed, and the uh, range gets changed. Okay. The only thing that won't change is the domain, because it'll still go to the left forever and go up and to the right forever. Okay. Very good. Okay. So based on what we know, let's do the graph first, okay? I was sitting here trying to think whether I wanted to get the information first or do the graph. But we know what this graph looks like, right? We shift, it, we shift that graph to the right one unit and then up one unit, okay? So here is um, the origin, and here is so y equals 1, 2, 3, 4. And here's x equals 1, 2, 3, 4. I don't think I have to obsess over the x, negative x-axis or negative y-axis. Okay. So as you pointed out, if this graph gets shifted up one unit, The horizontal asymptote isn't y equals zero, it's y equals one, because the whole graph gets shifted up one unit, right? So here is the horizontal line, y equals one, okay? And so the graph is gonna flatten out above that horizontal line going to the left, okay? This, y-intercept at 0, 1, remember everything gets shifted to the right one and up one, right? So the y-intercept over here at 0, 1 is going to get shifted over here to the, to the point 1, 1, and then up one unit to the point 1, 2. Okay. We're going to go to the right one unit. <coughs> which changes that x coordinate from 0 to 1. And then we're going to go up one unit that changes, um, I shouldn't draw that there, and then um, changes the y coordinate from 1 to 2, right? So we add 1 to 0 and add 1 to 1, and we get um, the y-intercept over here gets moved to the point 1, 2. Okay, are you with me? So... Now we can draw this thing. It flattens out, going to the left, and then crosses the y-axis, and goes through that point one, two. And you know it's increasing from left to right, right? It's going uphill from left to right. So the graph can't cross the y-axis above, above two and then come back down. So it's got to cross the y-axis between y equals 1 and y equals 2 because, of this point, because it goes through this point right here, 1, 2. Okay. So we go from the y-intercept at 0, 1 to the graph going through the point 1, 2. Okay. We add 1 to the x-coordinate and 1 to the y-coordinate over here. Okay. And now we can draw some conclusions. Okay about the domain range y-intercept, right? We have a new y-intercept. The domain is the same, right? All real numbers. The graph goes to the left forever 
and then it goes up and to the right for it. Okay. The range has changed, right? Over here it was from zero to infinity. But when we move the graph up one unit, right? The y coordinates um, never equal one. They're all greater than one, right? We move the graph up one unit. And so the range is one to infinity. The horizontal asymptote got moved up one as well, right? Instead of being the x-axis, the horizontal line y equals zero, right? The horizontal asymptote got moved up one unit to y equals one. The horizontal line y equals one. And then the y-intercept. Well, it's not going through crossing that a whole number, is it? But we can calculate it easy enough. To find the y-intercept, you put zero in for x and solve for y, right? So the y-intercept, I'm going to write down here, you put zero in for x, and we have 1 plus e to the 0 minus 1 power, right? Are you with me? And now you got to do a little simplification, right? So this is 1 plus e to the minus 1 power, right? 0 minus 1 is minus 1. And then by the rules of x, well, you can leave it like this. Or you can write it as 1 plus 1 over e. Because e to the minus 1 is the same as 1 over e. Right? And so as an ordered pair, or so over here, the y-intercept is the number 1 plus 1 over e, or the point 0, 1 plus 1 over e. Okay. So where it crosses right here, one over e, remember e is 2.7, right? Which is close to 3. And so 1 over 3 is 1 third. 1 plus a third is like 1.3. And that's kind of where that, that point is, right between 1 and 2, 1.3. So that's the y-intercept, right? 0, 1 plus 1 over e. Okay. I mean, it's not a nice whole number for the y-intercept, but that's what happens when you sh shift these exponential functions around. Okay. Any questions on this, ladies and gentlemen? Okay. All right. We got one more thing to talk about from this section, and you'll have everything you need to successfully complete the web assignment. Homework. So lastly, we're going to talk about what is called the one-to-one -one property. not equal to 1, right? Remember the base is always greater than 0, not equal to 1, okay? If a to the x power is equal to a to the y power, right? We have two exponentials. a to the x is equal to a to the y. The bases are equal, right? 
for the two exponentials. A to the x is an exponential, and A to the y is an exponential. So if the exponential on the left equals the exponential on the right, and they have the same base, the exponents must be equal. For the left side to equal to the right side. Then the exponent on the left has to equal the exponent on the right. Okay. That's the one-to-one -one property of exponential functions. Okay. You got exponential left equals exponential on the right. They have the same base, so they got to have the same exponent, same value for the exponent. Okay. So we'll do a couple examples. All right, so the first one is, all right, so we're going to be solving for x. We have 27 raised to the x minus 1 power is equal to 9 raised to the 2x minus 3 power. So we have an exponential on the left, we have an exponential on the right. Do they have the same base? So can we just equate the two exponents and solve for x? Not if they don't have the same base. They gotta have the same base, right? It's two x minus two nine. Am I blind? Twenty seven to x minus one. And then I have nine raised to the two x minus three. Do you have something else on your paper? On paper it says two minus two. Another typo. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So those of you who have a hard copy, will you please write 2x minus 3? You guys, I guess, are kind of my guinea, guinea pigs. You're, you're catching all my mistakes. So I gotta change that guy, and then I gotta change that guy. All right, yeah, so my apologies. All right, so it's supposed to say 27 to the x minus one is equal to nine raised to the two x minus three, okay? All right, so the base on the left and the base on the right are not equal. So we can't just equate the two exponents, right? But we can rewrite both sides so that they have the same base, right? Three cubed is equal to 27, and three squared is equal to nine. So we're gonna replace 27 here with three cubed. Now you gotta put that in parentheses. Because it's 27 that's being raised to the x minus 1 power. Okay. And so we have 3 cubed, which is 27, raised to the x minus 1 power. And then we have 3 squared, which is equal to 9, in parentheses, raised to the 2x minus 3 power. Now we studied the rules of exponents on page one, right? So we got three raised to a power and that quantity raised to another power, right? So to simplify, what do you do with the exponents? Multiply, right? So I think the fancy term for this is power of a power rule. So we have three raised to the three times x minus one power. And then on the right, when we multiply the exponents, we have 3 raised to the uh, 2 times 2x two minus 3. Okay. So now the bases are equal. So the exponents must 
B equal. So we can set the exponents equal to each other. So we have 3 times x minus 1 is equal to 2 times 2x minus 3. And now it's pretty straightforward to solve for x, right? This linear. You've done this a million times in your lifetime already. You distribute the 3 on the left. You get 3x minus 3. When you distribute the 2 on the right, 2 times 2x is 4x. And 2 times minus 3 is minus 6. And now it's just solve for x, whatever works for you, right? So <laughs> if we subtract 4x from both sides, we have minus x minus 3 on the left is equal to minus 6 on the right. And if we add 3 to both sides, we have minus x is equal to minus 3. And now if you divide both sides by negative 1, you have x is equal to plus 3. So 3 is the number that you can put in for x, and the left-hand side equals right-hand side. So if you put 3 in for x on the left, you have 27 squared. And if you put 3 in for x on the right, you have 2 times 3, which is 6, minus 3, which is 3. So we have 9 cubed. And using your calculator, you can verify 27 squared and 9 cubed are the same number. All right, let's do the last one. Four raised to the x squared power is equal to two raised to the three x plus two power. So you can see that the bases aren't equal, but 2 squared is equal to 4. So we can replace the 4 here with 2 squared in parentheses because it's 4 that's being raised to the x squared power. And now when you multiply the right on the left, when you do the power, power rule, you have 2 raised to the 2x squared power, right? 2 times x squared is 2x squared. And that's equal to 2 raised to the 3x plus 2 power. So now the bases are equal. Exponents must be equal, okay? You have questions? Yeah. Oh. So we got to have 2x squared is equal to 3x plus 2. Now we got to solve for x. Well, that's a quadratic, right, in a single variable x. So if we move the 3x to the left-hand side by subtraction and 2 to the left-hand side by subtraction, we have 2x squared minus 3x minus 2 is equal to 0. Okay. Do we know how to find the zeros of a quadratic after chapter 3? Some of you can use the quadratic formula, right, to find the zeros. This actually factors. Okay. 
Does anybody know what the factors are? Yes, sir. 2x plus 1. X minus two. Yep, 2x plus 1. X minus 2, right? And how do you verify those other correct factors? For what? To verify. And so then by the zero product property, 2x plus 1 must equal 0, or x minus 2 must equal 0, in order for the product to equal 0. And when you solve for x, you get x is equal to minus 1 half, and x equals 2. So those are the two numbers. You put in minus one half in for x on the left and right hand side. The left side equals the right side. And if you put two in for x on the left hand side, the right hand side. Okay, the left equals the right. Okay. So easy check, right? Put two in for x. Two squared is four. So we have four to the four on the left. And on the right, put two in for x. Three times two is six, plus two is eight. And you can verify easily enough that 4 to the 4th power is equal to 2 to the 8th. Okay. All right. Uh, so I'm going to take attendance since we got five minutes left. But you should have everything you need to successfully complete the web assigned homework. Now, it's tentatively due tomorrow night, right? But, if, you know, if we don't finish the next section tomorrow, it'll get me the And I'm not really expecting to finish the next session.